Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I want to do this sort of short overview. Um, and doing the German series, <clears throat> one of the schools I thought of covering was the Frankfurt School, also the Vienna Circle. And there's just so many, there's so much German philosophy as the conclusion to the series suggested that you, know, you just can't do it all. There's just too much there. So um, I did look at the Frankfurt School, thought about doing it, decided not to. Um, time, you know, time is an issue. But one of the things I encountered that got me thinking and sort of reflecting was this notion of cultural Marxism, which kind of has this uh, bizarre take in some places. And I thought it would be worthwhile just going briefly through what the Frankfurt School was, what uh, cultural Marxism or social criticism, whatever you want to call it, that came out of that school is and sort of its impact and influence, um, which is different from what... Which I'm, I was sort of odd. I was sort of shocked at the take that some people have on it, but we'll, which we'll go over in a second. But just sort of the background is pretty straightforward here. It's not a, not that confusing. So you're in Europe. Um, World War One is is over. A mass upset catastrophe. Um, revolution in Russia. So the communists have taken over in Russia. Now the thing, the problem with this is for the Marxists, the one country everybody was sure that you couldn't have a communist revolution in was in it was in Russia because. They didn't have a developed industrial proletariat because they were, you know, primarily a peasant working uh, society. And so they thought, well, Russia is too backwards to have the revolution. But hey, presto, they have the revolution. And so, great. So war is over. If you're a Marxist thinker, you think here comes the revolution to the rest of Europe. And there were movements and, you know, unrest and strife and all this. But basically, the revolution didn't happen. The revolution was postponed. And this is a real uh, philosophical problem if you have a Marxist bent, because this the outcome was supposed to be inevitable. The rules of history was that um, at a critical juncture, the proletariat would rise up and take over, and they'd launch the you know Marxist communist paradise of the future. Well, when this doesn't happen, you have to say, you know, why? Why didn't the revolution happen? It's very much like waiting for the second coming of Christ, right? What do you do when he never shows up, right? He's supposed to be coming, he's supposed to be coming anytime, but so you got to figure out, well, why isn't he coming? You know, what's going on? It's the same thing with the with the Marxist revolution. It never seems to quite arrive, and so you got to go, oh, if you're a committed Marxist thinker, which most of the Frankfurt School thinkers are or were um, at that time, um, <clears throat> then you've got to say, well, what? going on. And so uh, at the you know, Institute for Social Research was this independent thinking, um, you know, basically a think tank research institution um, in Germany and Frankfurt, and so hence Frankfurt School. And you have some key figures, you know, three, I'll just mention some names. I mean, there's more people, but you know, you can go uh, Horkheimer and Adorno, very crucial. They published some books together. Um, they're there. Um, and then later on, you have Marcuse, which we'll mention because he's, you know, probably of them all, perhaps the best known. I'm not sure. It depends on where you're getting your philosophy from. So by the way, this is, a, you know, late 20s going into the 30s. <clears throat> so uh, so they start pondering this problem and they're like, okay, well, where's the revolution? What happened? And sort of to simplify, they're going, okay, capitalism has sort of messed up the minds of the workers. The workers um, are not able to come to the intellectual uh, recognition of their plight that they need to because of the structure of capitalism. So it's sort of holding them down. Their minds can't get there. And one of the things they emphasize, I think Horkheimer, Horkheimer in particular, is um, you know, capitalism says you should focus on your individual wealth when what you really need should be doing, according to the Marxists, is focusing on the well-being and wealth of your community, of the people who are like you, basically the rest of the working class. And so because of that, they, they call this, you know, you have this sort of false ideology or this false uh, concept of the world where you're misunderstanding how the world really works because of the ideology that's being fed to you by capitalism. Um, you know, one of the things I think one of the obvious errors of this idea is they sort of miss the rise of the of the, the sort of the winning the win, the middle class wins, right? No one sort of planned that. The people who loved capitalism, the people who hated capitalism, none of them thought, well, the middle class is just going to win. That seemed like the most absurd possible outcome, but sort of seems to be uh, what happened more or less. So. Um, so, you, you know, so they, they have this concept and so they're really thinking about this. And so they have this idea that 
you, you need philosophers and thinkers and what they could become critical studies or critical theory. Uh, you, you want to do things to help raise the consciousness of the workers, to help bring them to a place where they can understand their plight and hence launch the revolution and hence, you know, boom, history is off and rolling again. Great. Um, <clears throat> so they saw the research and philosophy and, and critical theory as a means it was a practice, right? It was something that you did to help f change the world, to foment the world, right? To get to get the revolution rolling, to get the working classes rising up, to help people free their minds, and um, <clears throat> that was that was all well and good until, of course, in the 30s, uh, several of the thinkers are Jewish and they're all very Marxist, and so you know this is not a popular combination if you're in Germany in the 30s, and so. Many of them came to the United States. Uh, many, I mean, there weren't that many of them. A handful of them come to the United States, 10 or so. But, you know, Marcuse, uh, Dorno, Horkheimer, they all come to the United States. They're here <clears throat> briefly during the war. And then they all return to Europe except for Marcuse, who stays in the United States and has sort of a prominent intellectual career in the 60s and 70s. Um, but again, uh, you know, there's diversity in the school, all kinds of things. But I think the core of it, if you stick there, you can say they saw culture as uh, an important sort of, I don't know if a battleground is probably too dramatic, but as a important uh, space that had to be um, worked on so that people's minds could function correctly um, and that therefore you could liberate them and they could recognize that they belong to a collective mass and that the Marxist revolution would then take place. Although later, as you get later into the, you know, 50s, 60s, and 70s, their thinking changed and, you know, the Marxism sort of fades a bit and the, you know, general sense of the well-being of the people comes to the fore. And, you know, it's a complex dynamic with all kinds of disagreements inside of it. But it didn't, I think that's the, the core of it really is that, they thought that people had this false consciousness, false misunderstanding of the world, that it was, you know, their, the ideology is, is, is mis-educating uh, people, the cultural ideology. And so you got to fight back against that and provide a critique that says, oh, hey, no, this is what's really going on. So, uh, so after the war, then, of course, most of these thinkers go back to uh, Europe and um, spend their time there writing, working, doing their research. And they were, you know, somewhat influential in some ways. Marcuse is somewhat influential in the United States. So, you know, that's basically the arc. By the 70s, primarily gone. I mean, there were, you know, it's not that they just, you know, these movements don't end. This this thought doesn't end. But, you know, that, that line really had lost a lot of popularity. Other, you know, post-structuralism is going to have nothing to do with this. Derrida deconstruction, um, not interested in, in approaching the critiques in the way they were. And that, you know, sort of was became much more popular as, along with other, other, other movements also philosophically and culturally come to the fore. <clears throat> So, okay, this, that's the, the rough arc, right? That's where, when I did my research, you know, this is where you're going to begin from. And then, you know, I would jump into the individual philosophers. But what I found is this interesting critique, and, in in, in the, you know, like I love the internet, it's out there, <clears throat> where people seem convinced, I'm not sure why, that cultural Marxism is this incredibly powerful force in our society, and that it's sort of, um, when you see like gay rights and women's rights and liberation, this and sort of equality and overthrowing capitalism, that somehow this is all coming from cultural Marxism and that like the Frankfurt School uh, and their, their, their communist Marxist ideology has infected Western society and something. I never know what exactly the something is. And I'm like, wow, that is crazy, right? Where does that come from? And I thought, well, this is an interesting thing to reflect on and to say, hey, you know, what would drive this kind of thinking and why is it, you know, probably wrong? But then I thought, well, let's make sure it's wrong because, you know, they could be, maybe they're onto something that I've missed. I said, okay, I'll ponder this a bit. And, and one of their big claims is, of course, that, uh, you know, well, first, if you just stop and go, uh, Marxism dominant in the world, you know, not so much. I think we can safely say that capitalism uh, international finance capital, right? Globalization is clearly 
it, it did pretty well in the post-war years. Let's just say that, right? You know, it's not Apple. Apple is an international global financial. You know, it doesn't. So that, that the 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 so clearly Marxism didn't take over, right? I mean, that's so. I think we're safe there. I think we're, we can we can all agree on that. I hope um, that capitalism has been doing just fine. Particular particular flavor of capitalism, you know, international finance capitalism seems to be booming. Um, uh, whether how the wealth the rest of us are doing in that that's debatable but at least it's booming um, <clears throat> so then where is this influence coming from and part of the critique is the notion that oh well it's all at the colleges right like you see this all the time that colleges are this you know you know these just dens these sort of stinking dens of bizarre marxist socialist uh, leftist progressive ideology that's you know infecting the minds of the youth who are then going on to overthrow culture um, and this is uh, this is just uh, wrong. So I don't know how else to say it. But so if, if you just go, I was trying to think of what would be a good metric to check here. And I thought, oh, look, let's see what degrees are being offered from these progressive Marxist uh, left leaning, um, you know, socialist institutions in hiding that is higher education in the United States. <clears throat> and it turns out that uh, this is in the year uh, 2016 and 7 for the academic years 2016 and 17 in the United States. Uh, the number one major, of course, was business. 381,000 business degrees. This also includes finance, by the way. I think it was about 200,000 pure business degrees, and then like accounting and finance was another hundred and some thousand. So uh, it's a combination business-oriented uh, major. So this is this is by far. I mean, nothing is even close to this. So number one, the number one major at these supposed uh, dens of cultural Marxism turns out to be uh, business and finance, which is not surprising from uh, if you look at our society, but it is surprising if you think that they're turning out um, something else because they aren't. Another really big one is nursing and medical field, which is probably about 200-ish thousand bachelor's degrees being offered. Uh, engineering, a hundred and plus thousand. Again, this is going for, um, you know, obviously this is for, uh, for business applications. Um, computer science, 175,000. So all of the biggest majors have a zero association with um, anything even remotely like cultural Marxism. And the reason this is, is because uh, it, we don't live in that kind of society. We live in a capitalist society, and all these people are trying to get these degrees to get jobs and do interesting research and do all that kind of stuff and make some money. So that's not surprising in any way. Uh, what is surprising is that people, for some reason, think these schools are being run by these, um, you know, crypto Marxist communists. Because if, if, I mean, it's a good cover. I'll give them that. If the colleges are being run by crypto Marxist communists, a really good way to make people think you're not that is to do business, finance, engineering, computer science uh, as your main as your main output. Right? No one will suspect that you're really. Uh, somehow overthrowing the system by doing that, I guess. Yeah, it's a good cover, like I said. Um, so when you get to the fields that are heavily influenced by this sorts of field, uh, by these sorts of ideas, um, this would be some, a field like English. Um, so English majors in 16 and 17 was 44,000. So there was about, what was what is that? One-fifth, one-sixth, one-seventh, one-eighth. One ah, look at that, one-eighth as many English majors as business majors. Uh, so even if we assumed all those English majors um, somehow are cultural Marxists, uh, which of course would be absurd, you, you have two problems here. One is um, there's not many of them. And two, if you look in the world, who has more money, power, and authority? English majors or business majors, computer science majors, engineering? You know, let's let's be clear. The, the power, the prestige, uh, the opportunities, the, the, the money is it's going to all those other people, right? So the, the English majors are not, not winning this uh, battle. And then I looked at all the other social sciences besides English. If you sort of, oh, by the way, philosophy, 9,000. There were 9,000 philosophy degrees. So, wow. I was, just, I was actually slightly depressed by that number. I thought, oh, nine, that seems awfully small. Um, but there you go. Um, so, you know, the English majors and the philosophers could team up and not be... They're in their one, what would that be? Yeah, they're their one eighth of the business majors in finance. So, yeah, uh, so not, not dominating the world there. 
And then the, the rest of the social sciences, so now all of this, you know, history, sociology, anthropology, um, you know, all of your core social sciences, total, complete, um, is about 100,000 other degrees. And so even if you glom all of them together, they're not as many as the engineering degrees being offered, which is half the number of business and finance degrees being offered, right? So, um, so if you look at the college level, colleges are not dominated by, they are not controlled by, the main departments are not um, in any way driven by the departments who might have been, and this is the next thing I want to point to, like, like the departments that might have been heavily influenced would be um, English and like philosophy and some of the social sciences departments. Um, what's missed here is that for much of the post-war period in the United States and in U U.S. philosophy was dominated by English philosophy. Like it was, they were looking towards the air, quine, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Wittgenstein coming through England, the Lord linguistic language philosophy uh, was very much more prominent. I mean, there's, <clears throat> I don't think that's even a question in philosophy department. It's not that nobody, you know, studied this cultural Marxist ideas, Marcuse or whatever, but, it, but, you know, some few people did, but that was certainly not the dominant thing that was being studied in either English departments or in philosophy departments, and certainly not in things like history departments, which are going to be heavily influenced by, again, uh, English models of research more than continental um, models of uh, academic research. And one of the reasons is because the language barrier, right? If, um, German was not a widely spoken language, even in academics uh, in post-war America. And so, um, you know, it, it is a barrier to adoption where English thinks coming much more freely from England. Um, so that the influence was often much greater simply because there was a much lower language barrier. So, um, so A, the departments that might have been influenced uh, had a lot of other influences going on that were much stronger. Um, B, there were very, f I mean, so um, B, the, the education, the degrees that are being handed out demonstrate that the, the universities and colleges have, you know, they're doing everything but something that might be re referred to as cultural Marxism. Uh, and, and C, it's a misunderstanding in the United States to think of higher education as a thing because there's over 5,000 colleges. I mean, there are a lot of colleges and universities in the country, many of them religiously affiliated, many of them technical schools, specialized in California Institute of Technology, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. You know, the, a lot of schools, with a lot of different, so there's Catholic schools, lots of, of, of interesting, you know, the, from the Jesuit tradition, their schools. You know, we have this huge, diverse field so even if you have a major thinker, like Marcuse, I think, was you know, a, significant, a significant thinker, um, whatever you think of his, of his ideas, let's just say he's totally wrong about everything he ever came up with, right? Let's just say that. Um, then, but he's one thinker of thousands of schools that most of the time are, have no, for most students who have never encountered these ideas and they never will encounter these ideas because they're in business departments getting business degrees, right? And, and getting finance degrees and getting computer science literature degrees, right? So, um, you, so universities just aren't these sorts of institutions that these people seem to be imagining they are, that like they're, they're sort of controlled by um, sort of crazy um, crypto Marxists, I guess, crypto communists. And then second, they tend to, as far as I could tell, um, they tend to associate, uh, this cultural Marxism with, uh, gender equality, um, uh, race equality, uh, all, all of these sorts of notions, which is, I mean, it's not really accurate. If you look at the Marxism there, I mean, what's accurate for Horkheimer and Adorno and to a certain extent Marcuse and for the general Frankfurt School is they were, I mean, they really were Marxists, uh, particularly early on, of course, you know. Um, and they had a strongly materialist, strongly economic foundation to their thinking. And so to, to suspect that they were somehow focused on these other notions of equality is inaccurate. That's not what they are about. I mean, it's not that they ignored it completely, <clears throat> but if you look at the core of their thinking, I mean, it was, hey, when can we get the revolution rolling and how can we do that? And it, it was not these sorts of 
um, external, I guess it would be, oh, external is not a good word there. It wasn't this uh, drive towards litigating equality through the existing system. You know, fundamentally, they still want a revolution. Fundamentally, they still wanted to raise uh, people's <clears throat> um, um, uh, capacity to realize their own exploitation by the capitalist system. Right. And so it, it, one could even argue, and I've seen these arguments, by the way, that it's bad to make incremental advances in people's social conditions because it delays the inevitable revolution. And so you want to sort of maximize suffering in this weird way so that people will rise up and will fight back. They will, when it gets bad enough, people go, okay, great, now we're going to have the revolution. So you want to get that revolution going. It's the same way that people try to do things like, oh, if we can rebuild the temple, then Jesus will come back. So let's rebuild the temple because that will get the revolution going, right? So it's this idea of you want to do what gets the revolution going. And it's pretty clear that, you know, there are you know, broad cultural ideas about art and history and how you should read and how you should argue. I and mean, the Frankfurt schools are rich, got all kinds of concepts. But <clears throat> the social justice was certainly not core in the way that we think of social justice today because they're coming out of a European, uh, heavily Marxist, moderately Freudian sort of conception um, and, and living in the United States for a couple of years and then pretty much all going back, again, Marcuse exception, uh, to work again in Europe. So they're in a different sociopolitical context, a different intellectual historical concept, a different language. Uh, and so, <clears throat> so that it just doesn't translate, right? So like, this is just not what they were about. So, you know, you can be happily, you know, be against all of it, all of this, but don't blame, you know, Adorno and the Frankfurt School for stuff that they're like really had no interest, knowledge, <clears throat> wasn't core to their thinking. So this is very odd. And then they take another step, as far as I can tell, and then we'll just stop there, and <clears throat> and and say that this has somehow been these concepts have sort of been flooded out into the cultural environment of TV and movies and music. Um, and that is why uh, it has power, right? And that the, the power that it has doesn't come from the fact that there's 44,000 English majors. It comes from the fact that apparently those 44,000 English majors run major movie studios or something. This, this part I also cannot figure out. Uh, cause it, because as far as I can tell, English majors don't run uh, movie production studios, but apparently some people think they must. So um, so the idea is that, oh, well, then they, these cultural ideas that come from the crypto Marxists are being driven out in, in our uh, media. And then the media has power, ipso facto, the cultural Marxists have power. And once again, I just, there is, I mean, wow, I can find no evidence. I mean, by far the largest media company in the world, or at least the most powerful one, it's got to be Disney. Disney owns everything, right? They own Star Wars, they own the Marvel series, they, they own the Disney stuff, right? They just, they're Disney, right? They have, it's, it's Pixar, it's Disney, that they bought it from Apple, right? I mean, so Disney, you know, ESPN, Disney. So I go, I look at Disney and I go, hmm. I just don't see anything there that makes me go. So Disney is making billions and billions and billions of dollars. ESPN doesn't seem particularly Marxist to me in any way. Um, you know, and, and there, but Disney seems to really make decisions based on how much money Disney can make. They don't seem to be Marxist at all. They seem to be really, really, really capitalist, which might be great. So I'm, you know, they are producing movies people like, so good on them. Um, and so that kind of uh, critique is just weird. And so I guess what people are doing is they're saying, oh, we don't like the content or some of the content of the movie suggests that values that we don't like, which is great. I don't like the content of this movie. Don't go watch it. But the notion that Disney is making the movies because they endorse the values rather than they're making the movies because those movies tend to make them billions of dollars. I think is inaccurate. And, and they, you can look at this uh, test run on this. When one of the Star Wars movies, I forget which one that came out recently, did not do as well as they were hoping, they canceled several others. Because they're like, oh, well, these aren't making as much money as we projected they were going to make, so we'll cancel them. 
if you have an ideology you're trying to promote, you're not worried primarily about making money. You're worried about getting the message out there. So you would never do that. You would say, okay, well, this money movie did okay, so we're just going to keep making these until, you know, the proletariat wakes up and discovers they don't like Marvel movies, that they really want long histories of, I have no idea what, uh, the development of irrigation. Um, until then, they're going to keep making Marvel movies and keep, crack, you know, piling up the cash. And so, but what this got me thinking about in the, in the grander sort of, so end of, end of sort of, you know, curious thing. But, but the reason I say this is because to me, the Frankfurt School is, you know, because I think all philosophy is a you know, moderate, interesting corner of the world. To me, not that many people fascinated by it. But when I started, all of a sudden was doing my research on the Frankfurt School, all of a sudden I'm like, why are there all these references from these weird places to these obscure German thinkers who, you know, sort of, you, know, they, you lost a lot of credibility when, when, you know, Stalin turns out to have been the horrible, horrible uh, author of the, the crimes, right? When Solzhenitsyn and these things start coming out and the, in the end of World War II, you just realize like, oh my God, you know, this, this was just a nightmare factory. And, um, and so, the, the, you know, just a lot of the appeal um, goes away. And then as you march forward and capitalism is just sort of triumphantly bestride the world, you just go, well, yeah, that's the nice idea, but it's non-functional. So there you go. And I thought, okay, so we've got these obscure guys. They did some interesting thinking, nice insights, some, you know, sort of one of the things they're really concerned with, which is interesting from a philosophical tradition, is that they're in really individual pleasure and happiness is one of their core metrics, right? Or, you know, this changes and stuff. But one, one for, for, I think, particularly Horkheimer early on, you know, this says we want people to be happier. Um, you know, we don't want people to suffer. How can we do that? You know, this isn't a terrible idea. And so I was curious why this relatively obscure um, group of thinkers who had their moment in the sun, perhaps, but this small sun, small moment, and then sort of, I thought, had vanished from sight. And I thought, oh, this will be interesting. Um, yeah, wow, has all of this attention uh, being misapplied to them. And it got me thinking about the notion of the importance of understanding and thinking about the cultural context in which thinkers are operating and then the ways in which their ideas are being, you know, sort of ramified and used and the importance of looking for the evidence of that, right? So when you look at someone like I talked about, you know, Hannah Arendt before, and so, you know, just she's fresh in my mind is she always was looking for the particular. She wanted to go to the Eichmann trial because she thought, wow, that really matters to be there, to see the concrete evidence, to see it's in application. And one of the things I think is, is, is often misunderstood or misapplied in philosophy generally um, is sort of the metaphysical problem is, is this notion that, oh, it thinks about generalities and it thinks about abstractions, which is true. But generally, you also want to bring it back down to the concrete and say, you know, how does this apply? Where can we see this? Um, you know, Socrates and Plato certainly have plenty of metaphysical talking in there. But at you know, various moments, they bring it right back down to the concrete and to the very specific and I think that's um, a hugely valuable lesson to keep in mind is that, hey, you know, interesting ideas, how do they apply? Where do we see the influence um, or not? Like, where did, has the influence disappeared? And so, um, yeah, so it's just I thought it was a curious, it's a curious moment when the, an obscure philosophical school uh, is being, a, that, as far as I can tell, there's almost no you know, current, I mean, somebody about this big world, you know, few current adherents, but certainly not like a major going concern that's a big influence anywhere. And somehow it's being portrayed as if it is, um, which is uh, academically and culturally seems just quite wrong. Um, so anyway, it's like, is that a rant? I'm not sure. Anyway, so a brief consideration there of, of I thought of peculiar little vein of uh, philosophical culture and history I found when I was researching the Frankfurt School. So thank you very much. Just a side note there, sort of an addendum to the, to the German series. Thank you very much.